Welcome, welcome to Civil Debates uh, 5. Uh, my name is Michael Wheeler. I'm uh, a co-creator of Spider Ocho and a, an artistic director of Praxis Theater, which uh, maybe Ashlyn will explain why that's relevant. Uh, so I'm Ashlyn. I'm the general manager of the Theater Center and our chief producer of Praxis Theater. Um, and once upon a time, uh, Mike and I uh, were co-editors, still are, remains to be seen, uh, of uh, PraxisTheater.com, uh, where we uh, often had um, our, we were writing ourselves, and we often had uh, other writers writing for us on uh, local and national issues of interest and sometimes importance. And uh, and it was often remarked to us uh, by people in the in the arts community and uh, uh, and and you know friends and, and family that it was one of the few places they felt on the internet that they felt. Uh, safe to have a conversation, to express an opinion, to refute an idea, uh, and not um, not be targeted, uh, not have it turn into a shitstorm. Uh, and also, and this was the thing that we were particularly proud of, uh, that people felt safe to include their name with their comment, their real name. Uh, and so that was really exciting to us as we kept hearing this. And what we thought we wanted to do as art makers, as performance makers, uh, was to try to take those uh, civil conversations or civil debates, if you will, and put them in a live space where we all had to be humans in a room together, um, having those conversations um, and uh, making them public, and uh, and then hearing back from an audience about how they felt. And so, uh, with the theater center, uh, civil debates began in earnest. Uh, and uh, what I love is that the civil debate series began in the theater center pop-up space, and there's Frank over there. Um, uh, we started this little debate series in the, in the pop-up space, and now uh, this is our second in the series that we're having in our new forever home. <laughs> Great. Uh, so um, a couple uh, pieces of business. First of all, welcome to HowlRound. Uh, we have our friends from HowlRound here with us. And most importantly, you guys, uh, everyone here has voted on the way in on where they kind of stand on the resolution. And it's really important that we all agree to vote on our way out because that way we can then tweak the hashtag whether or not um, any kind of opinion has shifted from over the course of this debate. And that relies on everyone remembering to vote on the way out because if even if one person doesn't, then the numbers are skewed. So that's on you guys. Uh, I'm just going to uh, let you know about our debaters and our moderator. And uh, so first up, we have Shaista Latif. Shaista is a queer Afghan Canadian writer, performer, director, and facilitator. Latif's projects have been presented at SummerWorks, Halifax, Queer Acts, and NEC and Ontario Festival. Her recent work, uh, Archivist and How I Learned to Serve Tea, was programmed as part of Why Not Theatre's Riser project. She is one of two 2016 submitted protégés selected by director Nadia Ross. Shaista is an artist, producer, and resident at STM Union. Is part of B. Current's artist development program, BC Hub, and a member of the feminist art collective Bonerville. Her upcoming work, The Gold Punk, is currently in development with STO Union. Don Michelle St. Bernard, aka Beth Aldana the Blessed, is an MC, playwright, and arts administrator whose practice spans across Turtle Island and ranges across disciplines. Don Michelle is currently MC in residence at Theatre Passamarani and playwright in residence at Lemon Tree Creations. In her role as coordination, coordinator of the Ad Hoc Assembly, she works to create platforms off and on stage for equity-seeking artists. DM is a true believer. Brad Fraser. Brad is an Alberta native and one of Canada's best-known playwrights. From writing to directing Brad's work, spans the artistic medium, his plays have been produced internationally and have garnered him several awards, including two Chalmers Awards and two Governor General Award nominations. In addition to his artistic practice, Brad has written for CBC Radio, the Global Mail, and the National Post on topics ranging from theater to the effect of HIV AIDS on his work. Abby Deshman is our final debater. Abby is a Toronto-based lawyer with a wide range of experience in social justice advocacy, public policy, and law reform. 
passionate about defending and fostering civil liberties and human rights. Uh, he has worked with local, national, and international organizations to research, document, organize, and advocate for greater justice and equality. For the past seven years, he has been the program director at the Canadian Civil Liberties Association, leading advocacy and analysis in a wide range of issue areas, including freedom of expression, peaceful assembly, freedom of religion, police powers and oversight, and the criminal justice system. And last but not least, our moderator today is Sarah Stanley. Originally from Montreal, Sarah is the Associate Artistic Director of English Theatre and Interim Facilitator for Indigenous Theatre Canada's National Arts Centre, Artistic Director and Co-Creator of Spider-Web Show, and Co-Director of Self-Conscious Theatre. Sarah co-founded the Baby Grand Kingston, co-created Women Making Scenes in Montreal, and Diane Dett Theatre in Toronto, and is a former AD of Buddies and Bad Times Theatre. Sarah curates the collaborations and the cycles at the NIC. She trained at Cole and Jacques Lecoq, BFS, and received her BA and MA from she teaches at Concordia, National Theatre School in Queens. Sir was recently awarded the Elliot Hayes Award for Dramaturgy, which I had to accept on her behalf when she was not there, uh, <laughs> for her work on the cycle, uh, focusing on the Indigenous body of performance in work in Canada, recent directing credits, December Man and NXT, We Keep Coming Back Self-Conscious, and Bunny, Stratford Festival, Upcoming, Kill Me Now, RMTC, and NIC. I will invite our debaters and our moderator up to the stage. <laughs> Uh, just, just a plug to say that uh, "Kill Me Now" is written by Brad Fraser, but uh, <laughs> who has yet to win a GG? <laughs> uh, before we start, I'd just like to say that uh, the Theatre Center would like to acknowledge the sacred land on which we operate, which has been a site of human activity for thousands of years. Toronto, uh, Toronto comes from uh, the Kanin Kehau word "tekaranto," which could be translated as "where the trees stand in the water." It's part of the traditional territory of many nations, the Wendat, the Haudenosaunee, and the Anishinaabe, including the Mississaugas of the New Credit. This land was the subject of the Dish with One Spoon Wampum Belt Covenant, an agreement between the Haudenosaunee Con Confederacy and a confederacy of Anishinaabe and allied nations to peaceably share and care for the resources around the Great Lakes. The Theatre Center strives to honor this, the history of this land by sharing their space with all people, those indigenous to Turtle Island, and those from all over the world. Thanks. So uh, just to uh, bring us to the debate at hand tonight, uh, the statement, be it resolved that freedom of speech is absolute and therefore must be protected online, is uh, where we're going to start, uh, and hopefully where we'll finish with you guys putting your colored chips in one way or the other. Uh, to give you a layout again for the evening, um, the first speaker will speak for seven minutes, uh, followed by three speakers in a row who will speak by 10, and then the first speaker will get three minutes at the end to uh, come back to that opening, uh, their opening remarks. And then we'll open it up to you in the audience for roughly 20 minutes of questions. I'll come back to the specifics about that at the time, but if you're thinking about questions, try to formulate them in about a one minute time frame and try to direct them specifically to one of the debaters in that time. Um, if I see any reason to debate, to uh, refer it to another person, I will uh, use my powerful position in the center desk <laughs> to make that happen. Um, the reason for the microphones, just a reminder to everyone, is not so you can hear us, but so that it goes out clearly onto the live stream. And so during the um, question period, uh, Mike's going to come up, take the microphone, and ask that you use it, even though you won't hear yourselves amplified. Um, okay. so. Once more, be it resolved that freedom of speech is absolute and therefore must be protected online. We're going to start with uh, Donna Michelle St. Bernard. You have seven, seven minutes, Donna Michelle, to speak to yeas. Thank you. So, be it resolved that freedom of speech should be absolute online. And being as extreme as I am, I gravitated to the word absolute. And we'll be holding on to that throughout my remarks. To begin with, um, I would say that freedom which is not absolute is not freedom and should be called by another name. That freedom that is gained by permission is not freedom, it's benevolence. That freedom that is 
gained through negotiation is not freedom, it's an agreement, and agreements can be changed. That freedom that has been fought for is precious and complicated, and that freedom that has been achieved is at best incomplete, and that it's an ongoing effort to live up to this value that we want to mutually share. The absolute nature of freedom of speech uh, is perceived by many as opening us all up to risk, the risk of hearing the things that are said. Um, I would say that we have an obligation collectively to move towards a more civil society, towards a better way of sharing this space and interacting in our differences. And that it's not possible to achieve a civil society through the concealment of our more uncivil elements. That to not know what people are thinking gives us no means by which to uh, argue, to convince, or in the absence of that, to protect ourselves. And I'd further argue that to not understand the way that my existence is received by other people in the world ill equips me and puts me at a disadvantage to operate in that world. The freedom to speak does not come automatically with the guaranteed freedom of anonymity. So to be free to express oneself online does not necessarily free one from accountability to what's been expressed. It does not free you from the response of those who disagree or are offended. And it does not free you from consequences. It sim simply allows you to exercise your judgment in what you feel is reasonable to express. And in relishing that freedom, you should also welcome the response, the free speech of the people who have listened to your free speech. And I think that this is something that we can better cultivate, not for the benefit of those who revel in vile hate speech, although the benefits of, of free speech would be extended to those people, but equally for the benefit of the people who are willing or unwilling consumers of that speech. For anyone who's uncomfortable with being called a feminazi or being threatened with death or rape online, think about the person who has those words whispered in their ear at a bar and doesn't know where to say them or who to say them to. For every person who reads something that deeply offends their personal moral values, or makes them uncomfortable in the world. Think about the cell phone videos of people being shot and killed by police in the street, video that the police would not release, incidents that we would not be aware of. Think about Syrian beheadings that it's illegal to tell us are imminent. Because those are also things that are being expressed within the same freedom. And that's not to suggest that one is worth the other. In fact, it's to say that, hi. Mm -hmm. Sorry, I picked up my shoulder and it's really hard to get my clothes off. Take your time. It's more to say that by being aware of both of these things or all the entire range of these things that are being expressed, we're able to be fully aware of our environment and the people that we share that environment with. We are able to share experiences that we don't personally experience, I'm able to say sometimes I don't feel safe and someone who has no other way of knowing that is able to hear that and choose to make me feel safe. Protection is still possible with freedom. Accountability is still possible with freedom, but more importantly and of greater value, change is possible with freedom of speech. To lift up those things that we wish we couldn't hear simply because we wish they did not exist is to cripple ourselves in the effort to make that change. So it is, in fact, necessary to lift up the free speech of the things that we least want to hear. Thank you. In order that we can equip ourselves with counterargument, in order that we can equip ourselves with empathy for that perspective and understand that not everyone that thinks differently than us is stupid or crazy or ill-informed that the access to the perspective of someone who 
calls me a feminazi. It's not something I'm going to get over tea. But I do need access to that way of thinking, and I do need to understand how to work in a world in which that exists, how to work in a world in which I'm characterized in that way, and how to operate and move in a world in which I'm surrounded by people educated by professors who are propagating these views in their classrooms, or people who are, whose personal culture is impacted by their workplace culture, who've mangled themselves into the shape of the world that they currently exist in and feel powerless to change the shape of that world into something that is tolerable, into something that is safe, into a place where I don't need to beg the protection of strangers. One minute. To me, it is much more worth it to stand in the face of vile speech and to ask for allyship and to ask for others to say out loud, I'm not with him, I'm not with her, I stand with you. To me, that's worth it because it's worth it for us to all move together into a more civil society in which I'm not afraid of what you might say. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So we're now going to move to uh, Abby Deshman, who's going to be arguing for 10 minutes. Uh, in, uh, in an against, in the nays. Thank you. Uh, the resolution we're here to discuss today asks us to accept freedom of speech as absolute and therefore worthy of protection online. Freedom of speech, however, is not absolute and it's disingenuous and actually I think dangerous <coughs> to treat it as such. Of course we need to protect freedom of speech online. Freedom of speech is central to a democracy it does incredible things for a society. It allows us to tell truth to power. It allows us to search for uh, better ways of communicating. It allows us to fulfill ourselves. It allows us to connect with our communities. But the fact that it has a central role in a democracy does not mean it's absolute. And there are important limits on speech that act both through formal laws and informal community norms that are extremely important. We need these limits because we are a society that not only values expression, but also personal safety, dignity, equality, and justice. And these values, too, are worthy of protection. So in fact, if done right, limits on freedom of speech will support not only these other rights and freedoms, but also the very things that we strive to achieve, achieve through meaningful dialogue. If we get limits on freedom of speech right, we will bolster the very reason we protect speech in the first place moving us towards a freer, more diverse, and more expressive society. When we talk about speech online, what are we talking about? Well, the internet holds so much promise about the communication, the democratic communication means it could be. The Guardian described it this way. They said, when the internet started, it was a playful, creative, and open space where anyone could connect and every assumption, every hierarchy could be challenged. Instead of textbooks and newspapers handing down fact and opinion from on high, there was a blossoming of online communities, sparky, self-starting blogs, and Wikipedia to set the wisdom of the crowds to work. That is an incredible vision. We've moved somewhat away from that vision. As the internet has grown, it's moved from our desktop computers to our laptops to the cell phones in our back pocket. It's expanded from our social lives to our work lives to now our fridges, our printers, our televisions, and everything in between. And as it's grown, so too is a darker, disturbing, uh, more worrying side of internet expression. It consists of bullying, of shaming, of intimidation, of harassment, and it's often deployed not in order to upset existing social hierarchies and power dynamics, but in support of them. We have threats, specific and general, against individuals and communities. There's revenge porn, there's child luring, there's child grooming, there's harassment of individuals from anonymous people on the internet, there's harassment of individuals from their exes and very specific cyber stalkers. In light of these in recent events, we also have to now add fake news to the list of things that the internet has engendered. Misinformation and lies that are seemingly gaining more traction on social media than the truths, and at least according to some, impact of the US elections. 
The boundaries between offline, off, online speech and offline repercussions are fluid. Abusers flip between online and offline harassment, deploying online smear campaigns in the service of violence, intimidation, and control. Online social media threats have shut down numerous schools across the country in the last month, locking children in their classrooms and calling armed police officers to the hallways. We have multiple tragic cases of teens bullied and blackmailed by their peers and anonymous internet users who've taken their own lives. So we need, and indeed already have, laws to limit what we can say both offline and online. <coughs> we have criminal laws. You cannot criminally harass someone through their email, through their Twitter, or in person. You cannot criminally threaten them. You cannot threaten to take their life or do them serious personal harm. The distribution of intimate images without consent is also illegal. These are extremely important laws that protect people. Uh, we also have civil laws. Victims can, sometimes, take their perpetrators to court. They can claim defamation. They can claim invasion of privacy. We have human rights laws, workplace health and safety laws, all of these laws are designed to protect us in specific spaces in specific ways, and all of them limit what we are free to say. Reasonable people can reasonably disagree about the breadth, scope, and application of this law. Most of what I do is a disagree about whether the law is doing what it should be doing. But I, for one, would not like to live in a world where these laws didn't exist, and I would not like to interact in an online space where they didn't apply. Laws are not enough. We also need community standards and norms that go beyond the thresholds set by statutes and courts. Offline, we have community norms all over the place. Someone says something inappropriate, there's a reaction. There's community center, there may be individual center, there are consequences. Great traditional offline outlets for free expression and new ideas. Publishers, universities, newspapers, they exist so that we can be exposed to new ideas, but they are not required to be a platform for all speech. Our new publishers online should also not be required to be platforms for all speech. They should have the ability to determine what is acceptable in their communities and what they are not going to accept. This doesn't mean that very extreme forms of expression will not have a place online. They may, but it does mean that individual, individual companies like Twitter or Facebook should have the scope to say, not here. You're not going to be expressing that particular opinion as part of this community. It's been difficult to translate our offline norms to online spaces, but more and more, those online spaces are creating their own forms of community guidance, are creating their own forms of community conduct, and I think we need to move towards that and not give up that work. So this is not to say that the emerging legal and technological solutions are all good. In fact, some are downright bad. I've spent most of my career defending vile, uh, abhorrent speech from government laws that we thought went too far. Nova Scotia's recent cyberbullying law that was struck down by the courts is a prime example of a law that targets online speech that, at least in my opinion, was clearly unconstitutional, clearly not helpful. Nova Scotia tried to ban any uh, electronic communication that is attended or ought reasonably to be expected to cause fear, intimidation, humiliation, distress or other damage, or harm to another person's health, emotional well-being, self-esteem, or reputation. Basically, anything negative you said about anyone was no longer legal in Nova Scotia. That was ridiculous, rightly struck down by the courts. And in my experience, broad laws uh, restricting expression, those who are targeted tend to be critics of powerful individuals. I've defended local bloggers that criticized police, the mayor, the city councillors. They were hauled into police stations charged with criminal defamation. Students who created a Facebook post calling their principal the Grinch that stole school spirit were charged with cyberbullying. And groups that are already marginalized get singled out for biased enforcement, as has been the case with LGBT porn at Canada's borders. Uh, but the fact that getting these regulations right is very difficult, very messy, and often tips over into censorship doesn't give us a license to throw up our hands and say anything and everything goes. There is no perfect foolproof solution. The boundaries of legal and social permissibility will always be and should always be contested and subject to change. Ultimately, however, if we get this regulation more right than wrong, we should actually end up with a more vibrant, productive, diverse, and inclusive space for discussion. 
Right now, the internet is far from an egalitarian space for expression. Women and minorities are disproportionately targeted and silenced. While no one is immune from harassment, individuals from different communities experience online harassment differently. In 2014, Pew Institute uh, did a survey of how individuals experience the internet. Men disproportionately experienced harassment through name calling and embarrassment. Women disproportionately experienced harassment online through sexual harassment and stalking. A full 26% of women 18 to 24 years old were stalked online, and 25% of them were sexually harassed. Similarly, The Guardian British newspaper did an in-depth survey of their uh, 70 million comments and found that eight of the top 10 people who were harassed online were their women writers, despite the fact that they have many more men. Uh, closer to home, earlier this year, we witnessed what was termed Canada's first Twitter, Twitter trial. Female reporters that tweeted on that were instantly be um, beleaguered with hundreds of disturbing images, death threats, and tweets that clogged their feed for days. If we don't act in response to these problems, we, lose, we risk losing the open, creative, and possibility-filled internet that so, must, so many of us hoped for. So should we protect freedom of speech online? Absolutely, without a doubt. But is that freedom absolute? And should we protect it absolutely? No. We need to have regard for the impacts, both offline and online, that speech has. And for that reason, this resolution must fail. Thank you very much, Abby Dushman. So next up for the next 10 minutes is Brad Fraser, and he will be arguing in favor of. Freedom of speech is one of the centerpieces of democracy and allows all citizens the right to believe and say what they want. The vocal presence of the most marginalized or outsider citizens in any debate is the sign of a healthy democracy and allows all to share their beliefs with anyone who cares to listen. But thankfully, it does not demand all citizens listen to every voice that offers an opinion. This is an important element of democracy because we know that conflicting ideas often lead to innovative or more widely acceptable solutions to challenges that, that might be found by examining the issue from, from uh, sorry, uh, solutions to challenges then might be found by examining the issues from a singular point of view and conflict, particularly when it is constructive, although it need not be uh, constructive to be effective, leads to change, positive or negative, and sometimes advances uh, humans as individuals and as a species. As author and uh, academic Sarah Schulman states in the title of her latest work, conflict is not abuse, and the fact that we now live in a world that conflates the two makes the battle for absolute free speech everywhere even more urgent. <coughs> Free speech, like most of the other basic tenets of democracy, is not without its challenges. And all of these challenges have been exacerbated by the appearance of the internet and the popularity of social media. It is now much easier to disseminate hate, misinformation, and toxic material than it has ever been. It is also easier to stalk, harass, and threaten people more than ever before. Add to this the easy anonymity and non-committal community standards arbitrarily enforced on social media sites, the herd mentality of certain people on any side of the gender, sexual, uh, political divides, and an increasingly less nuanced level of discourse, and we've got a forum that can act with frighteningly negative power on a level history has never seen before. But it must also be said that these same tools have been used to positive effect. People with like-minded objectives can now interface and collaborate with one another like never before. This has led to myriad innovative solutions to practical and political problems ranging from microloans in developing countries to the Arab Spring. And while it has been made easier for commercial and state interests to monitor us, it has also made it easier for any of us to record and transmit what is happening around us with equally effective immediacy. Like all society-altering technology, the internet and social media have a dark and a light side, and humanity will not be shy about fully exploring either. Advancement is never gained without discomfort, and only those of great privilege and little experience would expect otherwise. Free speech may be challenging, but censorship of free speech for any reason, in any form, is so problematic that it must be rejected for the following reasons. First of all, who is the censor? whose values are being protected and whose are being censored. Each partisan group in society believes it knows what is right and has access to, access to some truth that those who think differently don't have. 
The right censors people for not following the dictates of its selective and inconsistent religions. The left censors people for not following the arcane language and rules of its selective and inconsistent pedagogy. One attempts to enforce religious dogma without having read the Bible. The other attempts to force the ideas of Judith Butler without having been taught critical thought. Both will cite the dangers of certain topics being discussed uh, at, sorry, so both will cite the dangers of certain topics being discussed at all with the pretense that discussion always leads to some sort of negative action despite a lack of evidence beyond the <coughs> anecdotal that proves their points. Both will disguise, uh, disguise their censorious impulses beside, be, behind concern for the well-being of others. Given the simplistic, binary, left-right split of most societies, nuanced discourse has been replaced by jingoistic and simplistic behavioral guidelines designed to exert control. So who then has the right to say which material is more damaging to society when both are, have proven willing to sacrifice individual rights to control discourse and the social agenda? I have, in the course of my career, been attacked by both sides of the spectrum. The right claims my work makes a mockery of their spiritual ideals and that my very existence as a gay man renders my work obscene, hedonistic, nihilistic, and worthy of suppression. The left has claimed my work is unbalanced, misogynistic, racist, racist, homophobic, and dangerous. Which side has the right to tell me, or others, what we can or cannot say or think? As an artist and a citizen, I say it is better to have no rules than inconsistent or malleable ones that change depending on who holds the balance of political power. Another, another compelling reason to resist censoring free speech on the internet is because history shows such limits don't work. Censoring words doesn't make them go away. It drives the thoughts and ideas underground to resurface later. History also shows that when the tools of censorship and suppression are used, it is invariably by fascistic regimes or governments that started by promoting and controlling the notion that silencing others because you do not agree with them and find their opinion or ideas immoral is an acceptable, even admirable thing to do. Whether it's a corrupt socialist regime, Nazis and their sympathizers, or right and left wing Western governments, the state that works to control what its citizens can think or say is also the state that commits further atrocities on the people. Censorship is the gateway to human dehumanization, imprisonment, and extinction. And finally, censorship, suppression, and disapproval are tools of corporatism and neoliberalism where progressive ideas are stolen, simplified, and reframed to confuse the ideas of progressives with the desires of unfettered capitalism. In fact, I would argue that the reality that we're debating free speech, speech on the internet tonight without addressing its role in the larger issue of corporatism indicates the powers of repression may have already won. This obsession with what we're allowed to say to one another in a de democracy that enshrines free speech this need to keep agitating the same limited questions and ideas concerning identity politics without addressing their place in larger issues, and there are larger issues, is keeping us from affecting real change. There is a great deal made of the dangerous power of words, how pernicious ideas can excite others to acts of terror or horror, and these theories are not without merit and consideration. However, one cannot acknowledge the destructive power of words and ideas without also acknowledging the constructive possibilities of words and ideas. If words can be used to destroy, they have equal power to heal. Suppressing the power of one invariably suppresses the power of the other. One must always consider how much popular knowledge we once accepted as true is now known to be incorrect. The fact we now know the world is round, witchcraft doesn't exist as a punishable offense, and left-handed people are not the vessels of the devil, hasn't kept us from assuming everything we're now taught is absolutely true. Like so many generations before us, we are capable of making great mistakes in judgment and reason. We are also capable of rejecting ideas simply because they depart too much from accepted societal knowledge and mores, even though they often later prove to be valid and beneficial ideas. While I won't deny that there are dangers to interacting with the wrong people on the net, just as there are dangers in interacting with wrong people in real time, I find far too many of the supposed incidents of hatred being expressed on social media are often actually a clash of egos, ideas, and personalities that could have been solved by any one party being secure enough to walk away from the fight. A presence on social media is voluntary. One has the power to control who sees and responds to their material. There are indeed a great many people who are not nice, but being an asshole is not against the law. Within all of this talk of hate and aggression, there is also a whiny lament about people not being nice enough to one another and disagreement being perceived as a hateful attack. No one has promised a life without conflict or a life without offense. 
In fact, it is often this conflict and offense that forces reasonable people to examine their beliefs and perhaps change them if they're proving to be no longer useful. Pretending a challenge to something you believe in as a personal attack has become an epidemic among some people and is dangerous because it minimizes the power of true hate by making all offenses carry the same weight. True. Learning to deal with these uh, incidents is part of what being an adult is about and fighting back either intellectually, physically or philosophically is something everyone should know how to do. I do not believe in the death penalty because the possibility that a single person might be executed through malfeasance or ignorance is too high and too unjust. I don't believe in censorship or control of language in any way for much the same reason. Whatever anger, malice or questionable material might be spread over the net cannot be censored to save people's feelings because there is always the possibility that someone with a valid complaint or a life-altering idea will also be silenced along with the unpleasantness. Profound ideas and creative solutions cannot be lost simply because people are worried about having their feelings hurt or because such ideas make some uncomfortable. Being sometimes uncomfortable or in conflict is an unavoidable part of being alive and a society without conflict is a society without change and therefore a society which is dead. Yeah, wonderful. Thank you very much. Thank you, Brad. Okay, arguing um, against the proposal is uh, Shaista Latif, 10 minutes. Awesome. Hi, uh, my name is Shaista Latif. Um, I'd like to say my name again. Um, <laughs> but I say because I feel safe saying it here because you're not gonna say anything awful back. I'm Afghan, I'm Canadian, I'm queer. I'm a child of immigrants, I'm working class. These are all part of my identity markers in my day-to-day -day existence. Can you say your full name and your last name on a count of three here in this space? One, two, three. Sorry. Beautiful. I was looking up online like so much information and I was so overwhelmed by it. <laughs> Because I was like, how do you organize this kind of thought um, and how do you speak to a room full of progressive people, people who are mostly involved in the arts or have an understanding of humanity or do that kind of work around these issues, right? And how do we talk about it in a way that it feels like we're going to mobilize and do something about it where it doesn't feel as helpless and it doesn't feel that you're so distanced from it either to talk about the politics and just the states, but that what we're experiencing day to day in this sort of separation between being together in one space and communicating, communicating to each other face to face is really severely lacking on online spaces. And we know this. I didn't come from a sort of a school of thought where I think the internet is this magical place where it's meant for people to connect and to share ideas. And maybe I'm going to sound a little paranoid and maybe my <laughs> way of communicating is a little bit more personal than fact, but the internet for me is a tool for control. Uh, it's a tool to make people feel a, a certain way. And even when I was Googling all this information and how to know, you know, how do you discuss the internet? How do you talk about the barriers that exist there? I kept thinking, is this a search that the other person can also be looking at? Is my Google search one that someone across the room has the same results? And it's not, right? It becomes very specific the internet starts to control where you're looking, how you're looking, what information you're accessing, based on your interests, based on your views, and it starts to become more and more insular. And I start to go out of my way to try to find other perspectives. I took a cab ride here, and uh, on the way, I, I asked a man um, who was driving me um, what his experience was with the internet, and his generation is different. He's probably around my father's age. My father doesn't know how to use a computer. Um, so it's interesting to have these conversations about the online world um, when he encounters racism um, on a day-to-day -day basis in real life based on what he looks like and how he moves about in the world. And this man in the cab, my driver was saying that his children now have to change their last names. 
even online, that they have to find another creative way of expressing their last name because they feel unsafe and even just maneuvering in online spaces. Oftentimes, I feel that we are in public spaces together and we get to interact, we get to be in this one room. But I ask, how many spaces do we actually get to take up on the virtual world? And I don't think there's many spaces where even people of color and queer people get to exercise their freedom of speech in the way that is respected without consequence, without threat, without being told, go fuck yourself, go back to your country. You have nothing to say. My mother, um, when 9-11 happened, her name was Fatma. After 9-11, her name changed to Lillian. And the last 16 years, I have witnessed the war on terror go from something that is face-to-face -face that you encounter with bullying and with names to something that is really translated online, where the attack is so easy, where you can hide behind the anonymous nature of the internet. Now, it isn't just about having your feelings hurt, right? It's about this sort of rhetoric that really, really pushes for hate and ignorance to occur in this world using very simplified language, language that can be shared easily. I myself as an artist oftentimes have a really hard time talking about discrimination and barriers within the industry that I work in because there's a form of silencing that also happens, that there are consequences to speaking up, consequences to having freedom of speech, consequences for saying that something does not feel right, does not look right, does not make me feel good, does not represent what I do and who I am. Has anyone been harassed online here? Yeah? Did you fight back? You did? Did it make you feel better or worse? Um, well, better, yeah. Made you feel better. I thought it would make me feel better. <laughs> And I did. I posted this something very simple. Um, I decided, what if I use the same tactic, tactics and tools that the internet uses to spread messages of hate? What if I took an image that's something that is of a loving nature, of compassion, and I wrote it without pointing towards anybody in particular, not pointing towards a specific political message? If I posted that, how many times would it be retweeted? How many messages I, would I receive that were maybe ignorant or full of hatred? And I did it right after the election intentionally to see what the feeling was. And immediately 45 people had retweeted my message, but in my inbox on Twitter, there's about 12 messages from people in America going telling me to go fuck myself, that they're gonna figure out where I live, that I have no right to speak about anything at all, and I'm living in the safety of Canada, right, to some degree. And I can navigate based on what I look like and how I communicate in a certain way too that gives me privilege. But in these online spaces, there has to be some sort of need for a moderation. And if it's not through governmental law, and if it's not through sort of a governing body, then how can we create moderators in each one of these spaces online, whether it's on Facebook, you know, sometimes there's community standard practices where even if there's a message of hatred, you can report them, but it doesn't get removed. Your only option is to block them. And then your viewpoint gets even more and more insular as time goes on. With Twitter, you can also block them, and they're the ones who ultimately choose if that message that was sent to you was something that was of a violent nature, of a hateful nature, and the only option, again, is to block it or to continue arguing. So how do we make sure that the spaces that we occupy in day-to-day -day life in public spaces are safe, but also the spaces that we use to communicate to one another, right? To find a form of resilience, to figure out a movement. With Twitter, it's an amazing, amazing tool for freedom of speech. Obviously, there's been radical, beautiful movements that have happened that have brought awareness to a political issue. It's really important, and it helps us to come together as a collective. But what it also does is that it allows us to hide behind the online world, the virtual world, and doesn't allow us to communicate face-to-face. -face. So what I'm asking is not only for moderation 
and for accountability and for these places that a lot of time freedom of speech is connected to marketing, to corporate ideals, to corporate marketing, that it's always attached to some sort of position of power, then maybe our form is to kind of unplug as well as moderating, to kind of detach ourselves from that world too, because it has become very, very dangerous. And sometimes these people are called trolls, right? I don't think they're trolls. <laughs> they're people, which is far more terrifying. And what do you do when you have to humanize people that often dehumanize you in these spaces? Right? And to think how much disenfranchisement has happened and the amount of fear that has occurred that the only way to be heard is to lash out, is to go after people, is to take up a space that was meant, perhaps, to bring people together as a way that is separating. Can you say your name one last time in this space? Shais Latif. Sure. Uh, it was on Facebook. Mm -hmm. And the way I thought back was private messaging. Private messaging. Did that work for you? Yeah, it did. Beautiful then. Beautiful. And I'm not representative of all the cases, for sure. And sometimes you have the space to like do it and argue back and to make that time. And sometimes when you have certain identity markers and you're navigating through the day-to-day, -day, you're like, wow, now online there's a whole other battle of existence as well. Thank you. Great, thanks very much. She's so good. <laughs> Donna Michelle, you've got three minutes to rebut all that you've heard thus far. Go. Indeed. Um, so I think I have maybe just two overarching points that I'll make in excruciating detail. Um, First, I want to say that most of the things, most of the problems that we hope to address through limitations to freedom of speech are not freedom of speech problems. We have a problem with uh, aging lawmakers who don't understand what a Twitter is and therefore are, are unable to adjudicate cases that involve anything happening on the Twitters. We have um, a culture of misogyny, racism, and intolerance that is not about free speech, it's about the culture. And um, that is not a free speech problem and shouldn't have a free speech solution. We have a problem of uh, nefarious corporate acts of intrusion and control. That is not a free speech problem. And those problems, addressing them through free speech, addressing them through talking less about them, diverts us from dealing with the actual central issues. And we have a problem with vaguely worded laws in Canada, and in particular with the word reasonable, which appears so much <laughs> and means so little. Um, and I came in here, I started off the top and, and said some super cute thing about how we all want freedom. I didn't ask anybody, I made that assumption for you all, that that's a value that we all want. Um, and so similarly, I think that like when we say violent, abhorrent comments, I think that that you and I think we're talking about the same, the same comments. We make that assumption because we're here in this space together and because you're a nice lady. And I am also, <laughs> I'm also a nice lady. But um, for all you know, I may think it's vile and abhorrent to protest NAMBLA. And that may be what I mean when I say those things. So um, the point is that there will always be an arbiter uh, and things that happen within reason or things that are reasonably considered hate speech by a reasonable person. It's predicated on our mutual agreement about who is a reasonable person and what is reasonable. So I guess the main thing I want to tell you is if someone has to exercise judgment over what is reasonable, appropriate, or safe, I can't trust you because I don't know you. And when spaces are moderated, when you say spaces need to be moderated, I want you to know that when I'm in a moderated space, I am being moderated. And I think freedom of speech has to be absolute in order to protect my right to speak about whatever vile and terrible thing I want to speak about, and your right to hear it and tell me to shut the hell up. Thank you. Wow, thank you so much. Uh, we're getting some water. Um, the gentleman going to get the water, Brad Fraser, and to his right, 
uh, Donna Michelle St. Bernard, both having argued um, for absolute uh, freedom of speech and arguing against to my direct right, Abby Deshman, and to my far right, Shaista Latif, um, arguing against uh, online absolute freedom of speech. So we're now going to open up to, um, to you all to ask your questions. Um, again, I'd ask that you direct them directly to each of the debaters, if you can, to try to keep uh, your questions brief. Uh, try to put your thoughts to the uh, debaters in the form of a question, uh, as opposed to a statement, so that there's something they can respond to as we work through to changing our minds or being resolute in our ideas about the central question of absolute freedom of speech online must be protected. So I open it up to the floor for any opening questions. Yes, please Give this a whirl. Um, so mine is directed to Abby, uh, and it's kind of with regards to what you said in your rebut at the end, uh, it's Donna Michelle? Or? Um, so if we take the example of uh, fake news or misinformation, um, I guess I'm just wondering how you feel, like what's the difference between um, freedom of speech as opposed to the absorption of speech. So, and this speaks again, I think, to, to what you were getting at, Donna Michelle, which was what's the difference, and I guess like even within the eyes of the law, between my right to speak and how you would enforce anything upon that, and how you would and how you would separate anything you might enforce upon how people choose to absorb that speech. Because I think there's a fundamental difference between, um, I'm losing my train of thought, I'm sorry. Um, I think there's a fundamental difference between someone's right to, to say something and have it be factual or non-factual, but like how would we, if not censor that, the difference between censoring and making someone more accountability, which I think, more accountable, I think a lot of what we're talking about with regards to online specifically is that there's a lot, lack of accountability, but I guess the, that two part question is just the difference between what actually would be censorship and what actually would be just holding people accountable. I can do my best. Um, so I think, I think uh, my vision of s regulating speech is larger than just censorship. So I, I do think there would be a problem if there was some grand internet censor saying, this is true, this is not true, you shall say this, you shall not say this. That's very scary to me. Um, what I think we need to examine more, however, is um, the various platforms we're using and what type of information gets promoted to people, what type of information gets shared out to people, what type of information makes profit for individuals, um, and what incentives we're creating. And then uh, challenging some of those structures. So saying, you know what, you cannot profit from um, clickbait titles. And we're gonna pull that ability back from you, which is what Facebook is now proposing to do. Um, or if you're going to put forward this information, you need to be clear about what you're doing it for, who you are, and, and where the money is going. Those kinds of transparency mechanisms, those are also called censorship by some. And I, I, I'm much less um, concerned about that type of regulation. So, and those mechanisms will bring accountability hopefully, eventually, and I think we need to work on more of them. I mean, so in offline life, we have lots of accountability mechanisms to try and make sure that what we perceive as news is actually truth. Um, and sometimes they fail and sometimes they have repercussions. I think we're still developing those online, but I think we need them. And so to the extent that you see that as regulation of speech, um, I, I say yes, 
you know, we, we do need to create the space to say you, you are allowed to put this forward into this space and have it be um, broadcast and you're not allowed to do it with other information. I don't know. I, you have to ask. <laughs> Just before we go to, uh, can, is there a response from this side? I get very nervous when I'm hearing these things because it seems to me, I guess we have to speak into a mic um, for the thing. <laughs> who's, whose job is it to uh, decide whether what you're reading is real or not? Who's, who's going to decide... Uh, what is real news and what is not news. We don't get real news from our corporate media. We don't get real news from any of our mainstream media sources. So where does your own personal responsibility fall into this to do due diligence and look at what these things are? And I know it can be hard because we live in a crazy world where satire is really hard to recognize now, particularly <laughs> online. But when, when we talk about you know, you have to identify clickbait. I think we have to teach people to do that themselves. And I think there's a question of, of personal accountability that gets thrown out in these conversations from time to time. Not ask, but like kind of tie in. Like what I, I guess the second part of that question was meaning to kind of direct towards his rebuttal there, which like, do you think they're, much like you're talking about the accountability, do you think, and like Don and Michelle said, a lot of the things we're talking about aren't necessarily freedom of speech, it's people's absorption of freedom of speech. So I guess to give you another opportunity, like is there something you see that can be done about, like he's saying, that people are had, held accountable to or given the opportunity to have the tools to form their own opinion that they can be held accountable for. Yeah, for, so for sure. I, I agree we need way more media literacy, and I agree people should themselves be responsible for digging into the truth of what they're reading and the truth of what they're tweeting, but I think it is unrealistic to expect every single person to rigorously fact check every single thing we read. Like that is, well, because we need to gain way more information than we have time to rigorously fact check. And most of us don't have the time, the resources, or the education to be able to do that. I mean, most newspapers right now do not have the time or education or resources to be able to rigorously fact check every single internet story that's out there. So um, because they're not doing their job, we shouldn't do our job either. I, th so I, think, I think, I'm saying, I think we do have a responsibility to try, but I'm also saying I don't think it's realistic to build a society where we have to ourselves verify the truth of everything we read, and we don't have any societal mechanisms to try and help us filter that. It's not to say we shouldn't be skeptical, but it is to say that if we're living in a world where every single thing we read is up for radical reinterpretation. If we can't count on any single source to be reliable, which is where I think we're headed in terms of Facebook stories, um, then we're gonna have a problem in terms of constructing societal narratives and figuring out what decisions we make. Um, because we just do not individually have the capacity to do that job for every piece of information that comes across. Uh, my question is for Mr. Fraser. Um, there's a great Anatole France line about how the rich and poor alike are free, or are, are, can be imprisoned for sleeping under bridges and begging uh, bread on the street and stealing loaves of bread. Um, that when you say that there is a, a degree of, public, of personal accountability required in all of these things, that it's like that those who are in command of power structures and those who are suffering under power structures are alike um, required to speak uh uh truthfully uh are 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 both are alike not 
are, are like unconstrained by uh, online censorship, then would not the voice that is already dominant continue to be dominant? Um, like Antoine France, France said that like 300 years ago, and the situation has gotten worse, if not better, in response to the in re rich v poor. So if there is equal, if we are both equally required to sort of sort through these things ourselves, um, aren't those in power going to be able to sort of maintain that hedge money uh, with greater efficacy than those who are suffering under that hedge money? I think I understand the question. And I think I would say um, that, yes, those in power al always have an advantage on everything. Those who are in the majority always have an advantage. Those who are granted privilege always have an advantage. But I don't think that excuses any of those people who don't have those things from claiming them, from wanting them, from demanding them, and doing from what e whatever they have to to achieve them, and that means knowing the world around you and knowing your place in it and being willing to challenge the people who are telling you that you can't say those things. And, you know, as a gay Métis guy who grew up on the side of the highway in northern BC with abusive parents, um, it's, a, it's a very difficult thing to do. But you know what? That's no excuse for not doing it. We do have to take responsibility for ourselves. We do have to challenge the existing paradigms. And we do have to be aware of the rules that are stacked against us so we can find a way, singularly or collectively, to tear those down and change them. That's my answer. Yeah. I'm curious for uh, Brad and Donna Michelle. I mean, like, uh, I, I, I agree with you for the most part, uh, but in our non-internet lives, you know, we have libel laws and uh, laws that prevent uh, incitement to violence. Uh, do you feel like, you know, when we say ab freedom of speech should be absolute online, do you feel like online should be uh, exempt from those, those rules? No, I don't. And I, and I came into this with the idea that things that are illegal, I'm not challenging those necessarily. Okay. And what I'm talking about, I'm talking about free speech as it exists within our society and with our law at the time. Cool. Okay. Then can I... Yeah, I'll, I'll just yeah. add that you are absolutely free. I'm absolutely free right now to say that I'm a murderer. And I'm not going to go to jail for saying I'm a murderer, although I will go to jail for murder. So my freedom to say that is absolute in real life as well. Right. It's what you act on that the law generally applies more stringently to. Okay. Unless well, you're then, uh, proposing sex in a park, in which case you can go to jail, as we found out this last week, for, for suggesting it. Is that new? Yeah. It's, no, it's always like been there. Yeah, okay. um, then in that case, can I, can I toss one more quick follow-up uh, over here? Is uh, What do you feel like needs to be enforced online that isn't enforced uh, in... in uh, 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 yeah, it, it, not online. I, I'm having trouble understanding the difference between the two. So, can I can I do both a reply and an answer? Uh, sure. Yeah. Um, so I'm surprised that you're taking the law as it exists now as a status quo. I'm I'm actually I don't think you can do that and say freedom of speech is absolute. I have lots of laws that I think need to be changed in order to liberalize our expressive rights. I, I have laws I disagree with that I think are too restrictive in real life and online, but you should not, if you believe freedom of speech is absolute, you should not be okay with the current state of things because there are tons of laws that restrict what we say all over the place. So I don't think that position is compatible with an absolute freedom of speech. Um, and then in terms of what needs to change online, I think we're still developing. I don't actually think law is the answer. Lawyers tend to think law is the answer to everything. I very rarely think law is the answer. I think we still need to develop more tools to empower users, to moderate their own communities. I think we are still developing codes of conduct online. We're still figuring out what that means. We're still figuring out that when Facebook bans nude images, it also bans breastfeeding mothers and the aboriginal people, but somehow not Kim Kardashian. You know, We are still sorting out and contesting all of those boundaries. I think all of those need more refinement, more transparency, more publicity. Um, and I, I think they will and need to continue to evolve. So I actually think those spaces where we are figuring out what we say and what communities and what bounds there are that are even further beyond the law are, are what needs to continue to change. Can I just a really brief point of clarity? That I think we both want to make a point of clarity. And I'll let you make it a greater length. I'll be really quick. 
If, if you've been given the impression that either Brad or I are fine with the status quo, then I can only apologize for a lack of nuance in how I expressed myself. Yes, I, 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 for the purposes of this exercise, I did not bring the law into it because we had 10 minutes. That was the only reason. For the record, CSIS, if you're watching, status quo, not okay. <laughs> CSIS is always watching me. Not okay. <laughs> This is for, hello, this is for Abby and Shaysta. Um Just to completely take us in a different direction. Um, I see a lot of, when we're talking about free speech, I see a lot of conflation between the idea of social media, which are corporate entities, which, are, which may or may not have gone public, which may or may not be subject to whatever country's laws they're based on, um, and the idea of the internet as a whole. So, you know, this person's blog that they bought their domain from like GoDaddy for, for like $3. So those are two really different uh, parts of the web with very different readership, with very different ideas and inputs and outputs. Um, how, in, in when you're, when you're just talking and discussing about moderation, how do you bring in smaller communities like smaller blogospheres, smaller personal websites, versus just talking about places like Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, whatever, whatever comes in the future? How do you how do you bring the the small the small people on the internet? How do you incorporate them? There are no small people on the internet. <laughs> 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 I am a queen on the internet. Um, no, it's it's more like for example, like NPR shut down their comment section, right? And there's online, there's other you know like uh, media sites or other larger platforms that are starting to just shut down the way that they're interacting with with their audiences and who gets to comment on one story. So there's that way of moderating it without going towards like policy and code of conduct. And then personally for myself, like if I upload a YouTube video or whatever it is, like I shut down the comments because I'm like I don't want to hear it. This is my work, this is what I need to do. It doesn't mean that I want to shut myself up from the world, um, but it means that I think with each platform, as you said, they're all different situations. And, and then for us, like, just on a practical level, like on a day-to-day, -day, like in making that decision as to what we get exposed to is important as a form of you know, self-protection and as a form of continuing to um, you know, mobilize and have uh, fine tactics and forms of resistance to fight against uh, online abuse, like with your collectives as well. Like I know there's power in numbers, right? When someone does something that is inappropriate or goes along the line of harassment, I know that um, there are people who would be able to support right away and to have this sort of, it's a mob mentality, like there's one mob mentality which is really, really dangerous, which we've seen everywhere, and then there's, has to be another word for mob mentality that's maybe more positive, nurturing that mentality. nurturing mentality, <laughs> like something. So again, I think it's like looking at all those tools and tactics that are continually being used on the other side of like, that are kind of supporting hatred and, and ignorance and, and using that to advantage as a way of, of moderating and really looking at uh, a way of responding that is not going to be deeply damaging for yourself, but also trying to be responsible and being supportive to the communities that you belong to. I don't know if that hopefully answered the question.